In this lecture, we're going to be focusing on the decade of the 1980s in the United States. We're going to look at the presidency of Ronald Reagan. We're going to use Ronald Reagan as a figure who, in many ways, his life embodies many of the important political, social, and economic trends all the way from the New Deal era of the 1930s up until the um, sort of the important uh, changes that take place during his pres presidency in the 1980s. And one of the important things we're going to talk about is how Reagan's presidency is eight years in office from um, his election in 1980 until he leaves office in early 1989, in many ways um, changes the language of politics during, in the United States and really redefines um, uh, how the, a conservative critique of how government should operate. And Reagan is really a very important figure and very important part of this kind of reconceptualization of government, reconceptualization of the role of government in society. And an important change that continues to affect the United States well into the present era. The language that Reagan and his advisors and his kind of intellectual supporters develop to discuss his policies and needs is, remains the language that many conservatives um, of his sort of uh, who have um, supported his policies use in the present era. So Reagan really redefines the conversation on the role of the government within society, on the role of the government within communities, on the relationship between governments and states and so forth. And so we'll be talking about kind of those two aspects of his presidency in life and how that has a broader impact on the decade of the 1980s. Certainly his foreign policy uh, was a direct reflection of, of policies that were put into place beginning in the 1930s with the New Deal state. His foreign policy was a direct reflection of the Cold War conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union that had d developed after 1945 and was certainly continuing um, in the 1980s. And ultimately his election in 1980 was a response to the political crisis that we talked about in the last lecture, the political economic crisis we talked about in the last lecture in the 1970s. So Reagan's very, very um, important kind of um, very liminal figure, a very important figure to look at as a way of examining these broader events and broader trends taking place in American history. Before we talk about Reagan's presidency, it's important to talk a little bit about Reagan the man. Um, and Reagan, again, this sort of embodiment of the tw of a 20th century man, a man who was really grew up um, and was involved and lived his life during many of these very important um, kind of transitionary periods in American history. Reagan's born in 1911. He's born in a relatively small town in Illinois. And so he grows up sort of in the small town life for, for a number of years. Um, has a difficult childhood. Uh, his father had worked in a variety of, of positions, uh, both in Illinois, in the various towns in Illinois, briefly in Chicago. Um, and it's not, not the strongest childhood. Ultimately, his father loses his job during the Great Depression. And Reagan is, has to sort of try to help support his family. Um, he works in a number of occupations. Um, he actually takes a WPA job during the New Deal. Um, he then works in radio for a little while. And finally, he decides in the late 1930s to go to Hollywood to try his luck in the movies. And as it turns out, Reagan is very successful. He is able to secure a movie contract uh, and works for quite a few years and, and works in a number of different Hollywood pictures over the years and becomes well known within the Hollywood community, becomes a well-established member of the Hollywood community. Um, to the point where in 1947, he actually is elected to the president of the Screen Actors Guild, the SAG, the group that represents all um, Hollywood actors. And, and this role as a union president is very important to him. And Reagan is certainly influenced by the uh, the era of the New Deal. He he's somewhat um, somewhat a liberal in his in his youth, but as he gets older and spends more time in Hollywood, he starts to become more conservative, especially after World War II. Reagan um, doesn't serve overseas in World War II. He serves in a number of support roles in the United States, primarily having to do with making movies, um, kind of propaganda movies that were supporting the war, or movies for the army, kind of educational movies for army uh, troops. Um, but during and over at the end of the war, especially as the, the Cold War begins to develop between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, Reagan definitely becomes a more uh, conservative um, in his politics. 
and especially in the early 1950s, he is a very important Hollywood conservative. He's very supportive of efforts by HUAC. We discussed the House Committee on Un-American Activities uh, in a previous lecture, their efforts to investigate communists and socialists in Hollywood. And so actually Reagan is very willing to testify before HUAC's investigative committees um, that ultimately lead to blacklisting of um, the sort of the Hollywood 10, these famous um, screenwriters, producers, directors um, who are seen to have communist aff affiliations. So Reagan definitely becomes more conservative during the late 40s and the early 1950s. He also works uh, for a number of years for the General Electric Corporation and doing General Electric Theater and as sort of the official corporate spokesperson in a way for General Electric, this large, powerful U.S. corporation, which requires him to spend a lot of time touring General Electric facilities, learning more about the company. And certainly his work as a GE spokesperson gets his name out there and becomes well known um, by the, being the host of this television host of the GE Theater. Certainly also gets his name out there as sort of a representative of corporate culture and corporate politics in the United States. And in some ways, Reagan helps use this as a springboard to move into politics and ultimately become a Republican. He runs for office in California in 1966, the governor, the gubernatorial race in California, and he's elected governor in 66 and kind of a conservative reaction to all the social unrest um, and kind of political unrest that was coming about as a result of the Vietnam War and sort of the student p protest movements and all the other things that were going on in, both in California and nationwide in the late 60s. Reagan serves two terms as California governor and ultimately steps down in 1975, decides not to run for a third term in office. In 1976, he runs for president of the United States, kind of springboards off of his success in California. He runs against Gerald Ford in the U.S. and the primaries, in the Republican primaries. And Gerald Ford, as sitting president, um, has a slight advantage over Reagan. So ultimately, Reagan fails to win the Republican primary. Ford goes up against um, Jimmy Carter and loses that election. Uh, but Reagan decides not to let his loss in 1976 stop him. And in 1980, once again, he runs for president. And he's much more successful in 1980 because Carter's presidency had been uh, had been quite disastrous. Um, and Carter, while be, me, while meaning in many respects, had had struggled under a lot of things that were in some cases outside of his control. Had also made some kind of poor decisions. And Americans in 1980 were extremely frustrated because the economy was was absolutely in shambles. Um, the um, American pol American foreign policy was was kind of a mess. America was not looking so good, and they sort of took this out on Carter. And in, in really, in many ways, a landslide election. They turned against Carter, and they went went with Reagan. Reagan had a very strong appeal um, to especially middle class conservatives. This is really where he where he uh, shined. especially in the South and the Midwest. Um, and really, Reagan's the support of these sort of so-called Reagan Democrats in many cases, people who were sort of socially liberal in some ways, but were economically conservative and felt that Reagan was a far more like, more, far more successful candidate than perhaps uh, Carter was to fix the economy and to fix a lot of the, um, the economic and the social problems that were going on in the United States. This was also part of this sort of broader realignment uh, and white backlash against democratic policies in Vietnam and especially the Great Society and um, uh, civil rights that led to a stronger Republican presence in the South and in parts of the Midwest that had traditionally been more of democratic uh, strongholds. So Reagan really benefits from this realignment. He offers hope, and he offers hope in the wake of this sort of disillusion and crisis of the 1970s. Reagan, by this point, is... Um, you know he's older. He's a well-established guy. He's grandfatherly in some ways, and so Americans liked him because he offered a very positive kind of glowing perspective on that America's best days were still ahead. America's best days were not behind it. And as a result of this, he 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 has a positive outlook. He has a very positive message, and he wins a great deal of support from these middle-class conservative uh, Americans, whether or not they were Republicans. In 
in his campaign, he promised to end stagflation and in this stagnant economy and this inflation that was just killing American savings, that was killing American businesses, and that was just causing all sorts of problems. He promises to restore America's place in the world. He's going to make America a, a country that can hold its head high, a country that's not embarrassed uh, and not ashamed of what it, what it does, and ultimately to restore confidence both domestically and internationally. And so it's a very powerful, very sort of positive message that he's promoting. Reagan wins the election in 1980 and assumes office during a period of, of again, still crisis, this crisis of the 70s that had continued into the early part of the 1980s, economic crisis. There's a, a recession, inflation, the price money essentially is becoming worth less and less. And as a result, Americans have less money to work with in their you know, daily lives because their wages aren't going up to match this double-digit inflation, um, t upwards of, in some cases, 16 to 18 percent inflation every year. So he's dealing with this economic crisis. He's also dealing with the legacy of Vietnam, this sort of Vietnam syndrome or Vietnam effect that I mentioned in the previous lecture. <coughs> also the legacy of Watergate, this legacy of extreme distrust in political leaders. And he also assumes a political crisis that had come about under Jimmy Carter, the Iran hostage crisis. During the Iranian Revolution of 1979, the Iranian revolutionaries had taken Americans hostage who had been in the embassy, and Carter had been trying very hard to negotiate their, uh, their freedom and had not been successful, and Reagan comes into office and um, almost immediately the hostages are freed. And so for this, you know, Reagan um, you know, had almost really nothing to do with it in a sense, but for it, it's, a huge, it's a huge win as he comes into office. So in many respects, you know, for him it's a, his first term in office is a response to these crises. And in many ways for Reagan, he's championing a conservative revolution against this sort of New Deal state that had been created under Franklin Roosevelt and expanded later under, um, under uh, the Democrats in the 1960s, Kennedy and later Lyndon Johnson, and articulating a claim that government programs in a way did more harm than good, that policies like welfare and various other sort of social programs where the government was giving, you know, essentially providing a social safety net or giving welfare support to poor Americans were in fact harming those people, that in fact they would be more successful if they didn't get government handouts and they went out and found a job. And, and this is sort of one of Reagan's broader critiques of the New Deal state is that the government shouldn't be everything to everyone. The government shouldn't provide a handout to every person that people had to, you know, this quote of this phrase, sort of pull themselves up by their bootstraps and, and, and make their own lives successful as opposed to expecting the government to provide a handout. Domestically, I'm going to talk a little bit about his, Reagan's domestic policy, and then we'll talk a little bit about his foreign policy. Um, his domestic policy was really about redefining the role of the state, kind of as I just mentioned. One of the big things he pushes for, um, he and the Republicans in Congress push for early on, is a continuation of policies that Jimmy Carter had, had initiated of deregulation. Deregulating American industries. Uh, the argument being that American industries were being choked by government rules and regulations. And that if you had fewer rules and regulations, American industry would be much more successful. Jimmy Carter had begun the process of deregulation of the U.S. airline industry. Airlines were very heavily regulated. They had to submit. They were very restricted in what they could charge people for um, airline tickets. They had to submit um, these very detailed tariffs to the U.S. government if they wanted to raise rates and to justify why they raised rates. And so Ray Carter and then Reagan in his deregulation argues that in fact prices will go down, service will go up, and, and people will, will receive a better value if the government steps out of the picture. And so Reagan's legacy, of course, is deregulation, but he doesn't start it. Carter's really the one who breaks, starts to bring about deregulation. Reagan and his and, and Republicans in office in, in the 80s focus on deregulation in a number of areas in particular, banking. Also the savings and loan. industry savings alone which were these 
kind of thrift savings organizations, which are really intended more as sort of community savings banks. Deregulating things like the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, who are seen to be so restrictive in these all these kind of crazy rules and regulations that they had uh, for businesses, that businesses spent so much time trying to comply with these rules that they, that they didn't have time to make money. And so all these efforts to sort of reduce government regulation of businesses. Also, Reagan is very strongly against labor unions. Of course, ironic since he had been the president of a labor union, of the Screen Actors Guild. But Reagan, in his sort of conservative shift in the 1950s, starts to see labor unions as part of the problem. Labor unions um, impede businesses from being profitable. They impede businesses from being more flexible. And he sort of takes a strong stand when in 1980, a federal labor union called PATCO, P-A-T-C-O, which was a labor union that represented airline traffic controllers, AT, you know, air traffic controllers union, threatens to go on strike in 1981, for, wants higher wages. And Reagan argues strenuously that this is that this will shut down the airline industry, this will shut down travel if all these um, these uh, airline air traffic controllers go on strike. And essentially r tells them that it threatens them that if they go on strike, he will take action. And while Patco goes on strike, Reagan essentially uses a executive order to abolish the union and then uses military air traffic controllers uh, in place of civilians until new civilian air traffic controllers can be hired. So he basically kills the union, destroys it, it's gone. And this is sort of a lesson for many that Reagan was going to be very conservative and that he wasn't going to put up with what he saw as sort of these uh, liberal or democratic organizations um, who were sort of interfering with economic prosperity. Another policy that Reagan's advisors pushed very strongly for was a, a theory that was called supply side and oftentimes termed trickle down this is how it often becomes known supply side or trickle down economic theory and the idea behind this was that if you reduce the tax burden on the upper classes if you reduce the tax burden on people with money or or businesses that more of that money will then trickle down into the economy. So there was a push to restructure the U.S. tax code, reduce the tax rate on the upper classes, which was actually quite significantly high. The, the, the upper levels of the tax rates for some people were, were talking about 60 to 70 percent, and maybe perhaps even higher in places. Uh, and so there was a significant reduction in the, in the uh, tax rate for the upper classes and people who were making upwards of $250,000 a year or a million dollars a year and those rates are dropped down to around 30 to 35 percent so you know 80 percent 70 percent down to 35 percent that's a significant savings in your tax bill every year and the argument was that most of that money would then be spent rich people would want to spend that money because they didn't need to have to save it because they were rich already they'd want to spend that money on things that would that would be luxury items but the people who made those luxury items would make money they would in turn spend the money for their employees and their employees would spend that money so ultimately that money would trickle down into the economy there's some question whether that really happened oftentimes what rich people in fact did just put that money in the bank where they put it in investments um, and they didn't really just go out and spend a lot of money on luxury items. Um, so there's certainly some question whether supply side economic theory was really uh, successful that many sort of Reagan and many of his supporters and conservatives argued that it was. In turn, though, Reagan argued that if you if you allow for supply side economics to do its job and there's more money in the economy, so people um, have access to more money, the, the other side of that is that the government needed to cut funding for social programs. That too much government money is being spent on social programs. And Reagan sort of uses this, this story that he talks about a number of times, and that's really never been shown to be accurate, of people on welfare driving Cadillacs, people on welfare you know, using scams to collect multiple welfare checks and then basically living like rich people even though it's tax money coming from the government. And so Reagan argues that there's too much money being spent on these these sort of great society social welfare programs and welfare reform needs to happen. Need, there needs to be this process of deinstitutionalization. People were just becoming too used to living on welfare. And then the idea was that you had multiple generations of people who had never had a job. They just lived on welfare their whole lives. So Reagan pushes very strongly to change the rules for welfare, to change the system of how welfare functions. He, of course, argued strongly that social security needed to be protected. Old people needed to have their social safety net when they retired, but at the same time, there needed to be a reduction in 
um, the amount of money spent on various uh, welfare programs and other sorts of social educational programs, um, programs to provide food stamps, things like all these sorts of programs that needed to be slashed uh, because the government was spending too much money on them. The last point to mention about Reagan's kind of social policies is that Reagan was dealing with a lot of sort of both public-private issues during his administration. Debates over abortion become very powerful during the 1980s, and whether or not the government should play a role in restricting access to abortions. Religious matters become a major source of, of, of tension during this period, whether or not the government should be supporting kind of religious charities or other religious organizations, and the role that, for instance, very conservative Christian organizations should have in advising um, political officials. Reagan and many of his advisors were very strongly conservative uh, bent. So all these sorts of issues of public and private matters play out during Reagan's administration. One of the impacts of the, his supply-side policies, and we'll come back to this when we talk about foreign policy, is that it starts to generate increasing debt um, by cutting taxes, by um, sort of cutting the amount of money that government spent on social programs, though that was, that was certainly less than the amount of money that was cut in taxes. And through his foreign policy decisions, we'll talk about in just a minute, we begin to see an increase in government debt. In other words, the government was spending more money than it was taking in in taxes and was essentially having to bring take out loans from other countries, or oftentimes, or private individuals, to cover that operating shortfall. And so this is a period where people start to worry because increasingly the Japanese were buying U.S. debt, and there becomes this great fear in the 1980s that pretty soon Japan's going to own the entire country because it's buying all the debt, much like today their fear about the Chinese purchasing U.S. debt. So people during the 1980s become far more concerned about the national debt. It was growing exponentially it seemed like it was growing out of control and how were we going to stop this 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 debt crisis that was developing and well reagan's foreign policy in many ways contributed to that debt crisis it was a sense a response again as i mentioned earlier to this vietnam syndrome this fear that the u.s commit itself to being a strong power in the international stage and the u.s was fearful about committing military troops to military actions in the around the world of rebuilding its military strength in the wake of the vietnam war um and reagan argues strongly that in order to be a powerful nation you have to have a powerful military and america needed to get over its its vietnam kind of syndrome and it needed to instead uh embrace a strong military and be much more aggressive against the Soviet Union. The only way to ultimately defeat the Soviet Union, he argued, was to be aggressive against the Soviet Union and take a strong hard line against them. So Reagan pushes for new aspects of containment. He really revives the Cold War, which had been so much settled during this era of detente of the mid-1970s pushes for support of anti-communist authoritarian regimes. Even if they didn't support civil rights, even if they abused their people, as long as they were anti-communist, he was okay with that. And so there's a lot of support for South Africa um, during this time period because they were sort of seen as a, as a strong bulwark of capitalism against the threat of communism in Africa, even though South Africa had apartheid and was, was absolutely engaging in horrible practices towards the um, African population, the non-white populations in South Africa, support for uh, dictators in Latin and South America who were anti-communist but were also uh, you know, abusing human rights of their citizens, um, and other things like that. Reagan's also willing to engage in lots of clandestine operations. The CIA and the U.S. military engage in a lot of, of kind of clandestine operations during this decade. Um, there are a number of scandals that come about as a result of this. The the sort of infamous uh, one, most infamous one during this period being the Iran Contra scandal, in which. Uh, U.S. government, uh, Congress in 1984 banned aid to the Contras in Nicaragua, which was a sort of a, a, a freedom fighting group that was also rather, uh, that was extremely violent in some ways almost terroristic in their practices. Um, but Reagan's administration really wanted to provide aid to the Contras. And so in, they arranged in 1985 to sell arms to Iran, who was an enemy of the United States. It was, I mean, was that essentially was almost in a way um, you know, w after the Iran Iranian Revolution was seen as a, as a direct threat to the United States. And part of this, and they arranged to sell these and this, these arms to the Iranians um, through covert channels and then skim off part of the profits and use the part of the profits to support the Contras in Nicaragua. So many, many laws were being violated as a part of 
this activity, but it was sort of an exa example of this broader dis commitment to um, supporting anti-communist forces throughout the world. In Reagan's relationship, um, we could say the same in Afghanistan. Now, there's a great deal of support during the 1980s for the Mujahideen, the anti-communist um, um, Islamic freedom fighters in Afghanistan. Of course, also has very uh, powerful consequences for the United States in the decades that follow. Well, one of Reagan's direct policies, direct engagements of sort of against the Soviet Union was uh, to engage in a new form of arms race, essentially to end detente and to focus on a policy um, called the strategic defense initiative. Um, oftentimes a lot of people nickname this policy Star Wars because it, the idea was that they were going to launch satellites and other systems into um, into space that would make it impossible for the Soviet Union to ever launch nuclear uh, weapons by missile against the United States. So they would essentially shoot down all these missiles. And the idea was that they were going to build this system and it would give the U.S. an edge in the Cold War because if suddenly the Soviet Union couldn't attack the United States anymore using missiles, it would make... Uh, the U.S. a much more powerful adversary. And this really quite frightened the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union engaged in a huge arms race in order to build up a massive stockpile of nuclear missiles and, and nuclear warheads to try to defeat this strategic defense initiative that Reagan talked about. Now, the strategic defense initiative was mostly uh, propaganda. Uh, the tests that were shown publicly were oftentimes faked. Uh, a lot of the technology didn't actually work very well. But what it did do is it scared the Soviet Union into spending huge, huge sums of money to try to match the United States' uh, efforts on military spending. Reagan also also earmarks lots of money for re expanding the U.S. Navy, expanding the U.S. Army, and the Soviet Union tried to keep up and just could just struggled struggled to keep up. Reagan also engaged in public diplomacy, going to places like Berlin um, and giving speeches here at the Brandenburg Gate about how the Soviet Union needed to end the division of Eastern Europe, needed to bring down the, the um, wall in Berlin that was divided east from west, needed to open up the uh, parts of Eastern Europe that were under extremely tight communist control. So Reagan it really does a full court press against the Soviet Union on matters of of opening up Soviet society, of ending the Cold War, of essentially admitting defeat, um, and, uh, and admitting that, that you know, essentially communism was wrong and was, was not a good policy. Well, all this military spending, in addition to all this domestic sp um, you know, policies, contributes, as I said, to a huge, huge national debt. Um, and the debt during this time period grows just exponentially, grows from about $997 billion, with a B, all the way up to 2.8 trillion with a T dollars. I mean, just massive increase in the national debt. And of course, today it's it's much higher than that. And Reagan admits it. You know, one of Reagan certainly he says in hindsight, one of his great disappointments is that the U.S. debt went as high as it did during his administration. But ultimately, his policies are very successful in destabilizing the Soviet Union. Um, Soviet Union essentially spends itself almost into bankruptcy, trying to keep up with Western. Um, and especially American practices. So certainly, as we'll talk about in the next lecture, the Soviet Union becomes increasingly de unstable during this period, Many, and much of that having to do with uh, the conservative sort of policies that Reagan pushes during his eight years in office um, during the 1980s. Ultimately, sort of in briefly in conclusion, to assess Reagan's term, t terms in office and sort of why he's such an important role within, as I said, this broader conversation that begins under his administration and continues to the present day, is that Reagan spoke to the 80s generation. He really communicated well with people in the 1980s. He really under he at least he sounded like he really understood their concerns. He understood their problems. He understood that economically the U.S. was in trouble and that needed to be fixed. It needed to be solved. He understood that people had lost confidence in the U.S.'s place in the world and the U.S. needed to kind of become a strong, powerful nation again in order to assert that it was a superpower and that it could challenge the power of the Soviet Union.
at the same time, he sort of harkened back to an older generation. He was grandfatherly. You know, he had grown up in the Depression. He had grown up in the 1950s in the early era of the Cold War. And, you know, for many people, he was kind of a strangely calming figure. He, you know, he was a figure who inspired confidence. And so by kind of being a part of this earlier 1930s, 1940s, 50s uh, era uh, and sort of being part of that era gave him a lot more uh, credibility, a lot more kind of credo credence in, in, in what he pushed in the policies, the economic and domestic and international policies that he pushed. So Reagan was very successful because he really was somebody who was sort of in the right place at the right time to be a very powerful figure in U.S. politics and to really shift the conversation in politics away from sort of the crisis of the 70s to a conversation more about the relationship of the government with uh, the society, the relationship of economically, the role of the government, and also the, the relationship between the United States and countries throughout the world, especially the Soviet Union. And this was really ultimately what Reagan's important contributions were during his period in office in the 1980s. Music